live now tweet going out now, which is usually the beginning of every one of the live broadcasts. I've realized <laughs> I was talking about the live tweet, live now tweet. And where are my show notes? There they are. Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. And the ultimate goal of this podcast is to learn a little something from each other. If you're listening live and want to be a little part of the shindig, send a tweet to PHP Roundtable. I've got the notifications in front of me. Eric Egger just retweeted the, the Live Now tweet. Thanks, Eric. And we're going to be, he, he's actually on the panel right now. So we're going to be, we're going to talk to uh, this really cool panel here in just a second. So the World Wide Web Consortium, also known as the W3C, is an international standards organization that has been creating official recommendations since 1994. And on June 5th, 2018, a brand new official W3C recommendation came fresh out of the oven, toasted perfectly to a light golden brown. We're talking about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG 2.1. So what is this WCAG 2.1 thing? It's the latest official recommendation designed to help us web nerds make our web apps more accessible to those who need accessibility accommodations. So really important stuff, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So now that we know that we're talking about, let's meet our fun-loving panel. I have not met, uh, I've only met like one, I think it's just met Nick in person, and uh, but uh, first time meeting a few other people, and before we get started, we are just sort of chit-chatting. I can tell this is a really fun-loving group of people, so I'm really excited uh, to get to know all of them in, uh, a little bit better. But we're start off in no particular order, as always. We'll start with Nick Steenhout. Nick is a web accessibility specialist with Noability Inc., or Nobility Inc., I should say, no right? Ability. It's not Nobility? Yep. Nobility. No <laughs> nice. Nick often speaks at tech conferences about accessibility, and he hosts the A11Y Rules podcast. Welcome, Nick. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. We also have the retweeter of retweets over here, Eric Eggert. Eric works with Nobility as well, and the W3C to teach web accessibility. His work is best described by translating WCAG to human. Welcome, Eric. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. We also have Tobias Nyholm. Tobias is the CTO of a Stockholm-based startup called Happier. He also maintains plenty of open source libraries and is a recent member of the Symphony Core team. Welcome, Tobias. Thank you for having me. For show. We also have Glenda Sims, who is the team A11Y accessibility lead at DQ. She is an infectious open web evangelist, active contributing member of the W3C WCAG 2.1. Welcome, Glenda. Howdy from Texas. Ooh, Texas. <laughs> and we were just talking about the W11Y. Uh, I'm sorry, W11Y. I don't know what that would be. Wildability. This is A11Y. <laughs> how to pronounce it? Wait, which, do we say A11Y? I look at it and say Alley in yep. the background. But you were saying that, that some people do say that, right? Some people say A11Y. Some people say A11. Some people say Alley. And you know, in this world of accessibility, that's all welcome. That's awesome. And then they have alley cats, right? Yeah, that's what Eric's got on his t-shirt right now. Very cool. <laughs> nice. I'm not used to being a t-shirt model, so <laughs> <laughs> excuse me for not having the right pose or something. <laughs> that translates terribly to a podcast. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, the people who are watching or listening on audio are like, wait, I want to see the shirt, so I have to go watch the video to see it. Uh, and finally, we have uh, Sandra Erickson. Sandra is a web accessibility specialist at Funka. Am I saying that right, mm -hmm. Funka? Yep, that's right. Funka in Stockholm. Sandra spends her days at the office writing WCAG audits and guiding her clients on how to develop accessible websites. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you. <laughs> so we're finally getting to this topic. Uh, I'm I, I'm really excited to d jump into this. As I was kind of preparing preparing for this, I was kind of looking through all the guidelines and kind of really trying to get a feel for what WCAG 2.1 is all about. Um, and before we kind of dive into WCAG, I, I kind of wanted to, um, uh, well, first of all, what is WCAG? Wic what we've been saying WCAG, I actually learned this from Nick um, at uh, whatever last conference we were both at, and WCAG <laughs> is pronounced WCAG. But in ep episode 69, we were actually talking about how you have these acronyms that don't necessarily have the vowel sounds to actually pronounce it. Like JWT, we usually sometimes say JOT, but like throw in an A in there. So WCAG, where is is it the most widely adopted way of pronouncing this or that's the way i say it and that's the way i hear it usually yes 
Yeah. I, I've heard it said WCAG, WCAG, WCAG. Uh, there's, you know, it's a little bit like A11Y or A11Y <laughs> or accessibility. It, it, as long as you know what you're talking about, and pretty much everybody knows what you're talking about when you start pulling out those alphabet soup, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard I heard Australians say uh, WCAG uh, and uh, do oh, that occasionally as well. So there's yeah, you can you can say it whatever you like. <laughs> I guess as long as it's mutually intelligible, that's the key, right? Just that we're yeah. all on the same page. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which I think I think that's kind of part of the what the document actually kind of talks about, and we'll get to in a little bit deeper of talking about uh, making sure that things are mutually intelligible. Um, I I do want to kind of look at um, before we d dive into the docs. Um, Tobias and Sandra were working okay. on specifically adding um, some accessibility things to the Symphony form themes, and I'm kind of curious from from you two what that process kind of looked like. Um, working together to add accessibility to an open source project like Symphony. Um, it was a few months ago. There, the the, the boots of four theme was like coming to end. Boots of four was uh, announced, so we were working on boots of four form theme. Now, like, hey, why don't we make sure this is accessible for everybody? Because everybody that builds Symphony apps on Bootstrap should be have a good good start on building accessible websites. So. I, uh, I created a site where I showed all the items or elements of, of a Symphony form, and then I sent that website to Sandra. And yeah. Sandra, what did you do there? Uh, I didn't do that much, really, uh, because I think uh, you had already done the hard work. Uh, I think I had a few opinions about uh, a few error messages, but besides from that, I thought it looked really great. And uh, yeah, like you said, it's a few months ago now. So, <laughs> uh, but I was just uh, um, involved in a short uh, uh, period of time and in the in before the deadline. So I wasn't really a part of the process that much. I I, I, um, <laughs> I say the process was quite short. I mean, I, I got some I got some uh, issues from you. You listed like three yeah. or four issues, like fix yeah. HTML errors and make sure the error messages are properly. Yeah. Properly shown. I mean, mm -hmm. before had the error message just in plain red, and it's pretty hard to see plain red if you're colorblind. Yeah, so you like exactly. A, like you a, should like have a... something else besides the color to, yeah. to uh, point out uh, there is an error. So. So, so, so I think when I got that list from you, I think I added like four or five pull requests with like changing 50 lines of code. Mm. And those pull requests, I said, uh, here's where the accessibility expert said, and here's a reference to VCAG. And they, they were fairly quickly merged, oh. and um, and since I mean we did one thing we put the error messages inside the labels because then when oh, or or you you why did we do that because uh, we do that because the labels are properly connected to each field and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, when the user has focus on an input field they will also receive focus on the error message when when there is one. So that is Funke's uh, re um, uh, recommendation to do to do it that way. Um, so that's what I recommended as well. We got, mm. we got quite a few pull requests on Symphony mm. to remove that. Can oh, that? that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they like, hey, error message shouldn't be in the label because that's wrong. They said, and they okay. are trying to remove it with, with no particular reason. Okay, so, um, if that, if they if not have any reason, they should definitely be there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I said, hey, no, 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 this is actually intentional. We yeah. want the error message to be here because of this and that reason. So I, I, I guess it's it, to document the code better to, to yeah. make sure nobody tries to make a pull request to reverse their changes. I suppose it also depends on where you want to place the error message because it's very common that you want to place the error message, a message um, underneath the input field. And mm -hmm. then it's much mm -hmm. more difficult to embed it inside the, the label, obviously. So. Um, Maybe it's, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I hope they keep it that way. Yeah, because, but that was quite the process. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I said something to Sandra, Sandra reviewed it, and then I make some mm -hmm. fixes, and then, then just rinse and repeat. Cool. Mm -hmm. Now I'm really gonna have to make sure that uh, I go with, like on my next form that I play with because I, I deal with a lot of forms for some reason. But now I'm I've got to play with this putting the error message in the label. That's that's there's, really cool. The thing yeah, is, 
the thing is, that's one way to do it. And, yeah, and exactly. one of the most frustrating thing uh, answers I give to a lot of people asking me question about accessibility is uh, it depends. You know, you, you can mm. do it that way, but there's there's other ways to do it. You can put it in a paragraph after the input field and tie the paragraph to the input field with area described by. You, yeah. I mean, it, there's several different ways to achieve an accessible result that doesn't necessarily mean um, that you have to do it one way it depends on your context that, that is very true uh, i think uh, the main reason why we we at uh, funka um at first hand do not recommend vi uh, to use viaria is, viaria is that uh the support for viaria in different screen readers varies a lot so yeah. you would it's possible that you would have um, that you would have a user that has a screen reader that does not does not support Viaria correctly, and then that user wouldn't receive the yeah. error message at all. So, if you can find other ways to do it using yeah. native elements, you should. Yeah. Well, but that's the first absolutely. rule of area, isn't it? The first yeah. rule of area yeah. is don't <laughs> use area if you can avoid <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So I'm, I'm curious, just sort of on these same lines, we like talking about just moving the error messages into the label to kind of make it more accessible. Are there certain common things you see in the wild that aren't accessible that could have a totally quick and easy fix to them that would make them accessible by just tweaking one or two things? And this is just to anybody, by the way. <laughs> Go on, Eric, you're dying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, there are a lot of, of things that are like easy fixes. Um, you know, one of the biggest mistakes we see is uh, uh, it's alternative text that is just not there. You know, when you have an image, you have to describe it for people who can't see it. Um, another thing is uh, is fonts um, and buttons and keyboard interaction. So when uh, people uh, navigate a site using assistive technology, so screen reader or um, a switch input, um, and you can Google what that is, um, <laughs> because it's it's uh, really hard to explain, but it's it's quite uh, interesting. So it's basically one big button where you can move around uh, on the page. Mm -hmm. They are basically using the website using the keyboard only, so they don't have a um, a mouse attached, and they don't use the mouse. So um, uh, you have to make sure that everything works also with the keyboard, uh, and those are the big things that we see that are really like mainstream things that are, um, uh, yeah, that, that are basically um, uh, broken by web developers uh, every single day because a standard HTML um, website is pretty much accessible. Um, and then you basically take out the accessibility because you do something fancy uh, and you forget to fix the stuff that you, th mm. that you did. Um, and uh, that's where WCAG comes in and gives you uh, good guidelines where you can um, uh, test your solutions and say, uh, does this conform to WCAG? Does this uh, really uh, meet everything I need to think about uh, in terms of accessibility? Interesting. So it, mainly without doing all the fancy things, we're mostly accessible by default when we just kind of stick to the old 1990s way of doing things. Yeah. But once we start getting into the latest and greatest thing that generates all this insanity in, on the front end, then we start like losing that accessibility, right? Yeah. Yes, you can <laughs> say it like that. <laughs> The core, the core of every web technology that is developed is accessible. Uh, I mean, W3C is not developing anything that is not accessible in its core. And of course, you got so many things that you can do with JavaScript and uh, you know modern coding techniques uh, that you can use stuff differently than you intended or th than it was intended, uh, and that can create issues. And, and the way I think about it um, is that if you use the native elements, accessibility is a freebie. It's already in there. If you're going to develop something from scratch, you now own the responsibility to build the accessibility in. So it's not that you can't do anything fancy. It's just that you just took responsibility. That's very well explained, I think. For sure, for sure. I'm curious, uh, just sort of before we jump in, I do want to jump into WCAG officially, but there is one other question that's kind of related to this. Uh, on, the, on the flip side of what I was asking about what's, what's easy to make accessible, are there things that are particularly difficult to make accessible on the web? So I want to answer that 
um, because I, I first want to say that I love the ones that are super challenging. Um, and so when I think about accessibility, I like to start with the really hard stuff. Like, can a blind person drive a car? Not have the car drive for them, but can they drive the car? Mm -hmm. um, can you make a museum accessible? OK, those things are hard. And in that area, the things that I find the most challenging right now are virtual reality. OK, I haven't quite figured out how to make that accessible. Um, and highly visual games. There's a game on iPhone and Android called Black Box. I dare you to go download it and play it. It is so visual, it's accessible. So, you know, I think driving a car by yourself and virtual reality, those are the hard ones. Yeah. But uh, the other thing is that most of the people that are going to listen to this podcast, they're, they're developers. And I have yet to meet a developer that doesn't like a coding challenge. So instead of thinking about accessibility mm -hmm. as a, hey, it's difficult, oh, it's such a chore, why don't you look at it as a coding challenge? You have yeah. parameters to play around, and, and there you go. There's your coding challenge. Force yourself to do something you don't normally do and make yourself better. Develop your skills, and you're going to find out it's actually quite fun. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And uh, the other thing is that we see a lot of people doing experimental stuff, like, you know, really big, like the sliders on the whole page or mm -hmm. infinite loading uh, websites and stuff like that. Um, and that can sometimes be very hard to to make accessible because of the underlying technique used. Um, uh, but in reality, 99% of our work is the basics, you know, is forms, is links, is uh, a good document structure. Um, and let's concentrate on that before we think about what is really hard, mm -hmm. because, you know, that's the, the bulk of, of work that needs to be done. For sure, for sure. Well, this has been good. I want to start diving into WCAG, but this is the not this is not the first WCAG we've seen because this is WCAG 2.1 that we're talking about. There is a decade old WCAG 2.0. So, how is WCAG 2.1 different from 2.0? Is this like a complete rewrite, or is this like just sort of like an addendum? It's twelve new requirements added on to the already thirty-eight requirements that are in WCAG two point oh. And when I say twelve new requirements on top of WCAG two point oh thirty-eight, I'm talking about at the A and double A level. So WCAG two point oh, even though it's a decade old, is solid as a rock. Still, what you want to do, and then we're adding twelve more requirements on top. Very cool. So you mentioned A, double A, and, and triple A. What, what are those things? So when they first wrote WCAG 2.0, they wanted to break it into levels and it, giving people an option. Like perhaps you might just go to the first level and say, all right, I'm going to unlock the door for some people with disabilities and let them in. That's single A. Like, if you don't do single A, you basically left the front door locked and nobody can get in. Double A is taking more disabilities into account. And everywhere that I've seen, internationally, in the US, um, everybody's requirements are A and double A. When we go all the way to triple A, it is. Um, there's some stuff in there that's really fantastic to do, but it may not be something that we can all do. So triple A becomes things you win competitions on or you're like super cool. Very cool. So I'm curious if uh, WCAG, I know it, it hits a wide spectrum of different uh, disabilities and different devices. Is it, uh, does it touch anything with uh, touch devices or anything like that? Yeah, WCAG 2.1 um, is the first time we got to pick up touch devices because when cool. WCAG 2.0 was written, it was finalized and published in 2008, right? Do you remember what your mobile devices looked like in 2008? <laughs> they were like like candy bar phone stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so that was just added. That was one of the big ads in 2.1 is to pick up mobile accessibility needs as well as low vision and one cognitive we got a long way to go on cognitive but we did get one added 
So if we're, if we're just starting to make our websites more accessible the first time we've looked at WCAG, do we want to start by looking at WCAG, WCAG 2.0 and then move on to 2.1, or should we just start just looking at 2.1 straight away? So Eric and Nick, what do you think? I, I know what I think. <laughs> well, uh, you know, WCAG 2.1 includes everything from WCAG 2.0, um, and I think that's something we need to reiterate yeah. and reiterate because it's something that hasn't sunk in with a lot of people. So I think if you really uh, want to make your accessibility stuff, you know, future proof, you should dive into WCAG 2.1 immediately um, and and take it on. Um, you can uh, you can take the 2.1 stuff on the side and and uh, uh, give that a lower priority, but you should have it on your radar because you know here in Europe, for example, the uh, the uh, legislative um, stuff is moving relatively fast to adopt WCAG 2.1, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so there might be regulation coming at you, and then you got a leg up from other people who uh, are still a decade a decade behind. You know, yeah. the thing is that. 2.1 is adding a few things, but it's not it's not really technically demanding. Um, I, I had the pleasure of working with Goodwitch to uh, help make sure that my Accessibility Rules podcast was actually 2.1 compliant. It was one of the uh, implementation website for, for 2.1 going forward, and it's not that difficult, sure. You you have to think about things a little bit differently if not you're not used to think about that. But you know why not do it? It's there. It exists. It's a good guideline. And ultimately, I, I would hope that people are interested in implementing accessibility because they want people with disabilities to be able to use their sites, not because they want to be able to tick a check mark and say, "Hey, I comply with." Uh, 2.0 double A or 2.1 triple A or whatever. So it, it's really more about helping us understand how to code our sites to make sure more more people can uh, can use them. And the cool the cool thing about WCAG 2.1 is that it's picking up on some areas that, like Nick said, just broaden your market so much because low vision. There are so many people with low vision. We all have low vision when we're trying to use a mobile device in a highly sunshine vicinity where you've got tons of glare. Um, and then mobile devices uh, and speech as input. Back when WCAG 2.0 was written, speech as input was not very common. Um, but we talk to our devices all the time. So there's some important things in there. And for the record, Nobility um, and Nick's work with the Ally Rules, Funka, and DeQ, we're already WCAG 2.1 compliant. In other words, we're doing it. <laughs> I have I have customers, oh, Funka's AAA, because they're wow. cool like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, if we're if we were to go look at WCAG 2.1 on the W3C website, it is a really long page. It takes a long time to scroll through, so it might be a little daunting. Try, try printing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't. Think about the environment, please. Don't yes, <laughs> absolutely. So I, it, the funny thing is, there's uh, as long as that page is, there's technically only 13 official guidelines, right, within the whole document? So guidelines aren't measurable. <laughs> <laughs> So when I saw your question about the guidelines, I thought, you know, that's a really good way to think about it from the high viewpoint. But if you're actually going to test, and I'm sure every other expert on this call is going to agree with me, we don't just stay at that high level conceptual. We go down to the individual success criteria of which there are 38 of those checks, success criteria in 2.0 and 12 new ones in uh, 2.1 if you're going to the AA level. So it's more, it's 50, <laughs> it's 50 checks. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like the guidelines because they give you the overview, like, um, uh, like something you can aspire to, you know, if you if you get the guidelines and you, you say, okay, that's that's actually what I'm working th uh, to towards, and you got stuff like adaptable, distinguishable, you know, those are really catchy words that can 
guide you through a designing or development phase of your website. Yeah, um, and that can help you to, to have your thoughts. And then you look into the success criteria, uh, which give you stuff that you can really test on. So for example, for adaptable, it says, uh, make sure that you can orient your phone or your device in any way you you like, you know, uh, and your website doesn't break when you when you uh, oh. rotate it to landscape, um, and that's that's important. But you know that's inadaptable. And once you read through it once, you probably got that in the back of your head, and you don't you know you don't fix that into one orientation. Uh, pers personally, I uh, rarely use the guidelines that much because Funke has developed uh, our own. A uh, set of requirements that corresponds to VCAG in different ways. For instance, there are one of our first uh, requirements uh, is that you sh should uh, use techniques that can be used accessible in an accessible way, or you should uh, code uh, forms correctly or whatever. So uh, I use those more uh, than uh, looking at the guidelines. But sometimes I have to go back to VCAG and to read in to what. VCAG says exactly in order to make um, uh, a good judgment on how my client responds to it. So uh, for me, our requirements uh, are a bit more specific uh, to to measure. <clears throat> yeah, and and I think that's a th that's a good and valid point, and I don't want to get into some <laughs> sort of weird place by saying that. But uh, uh, in in reality, you know, the the WCAG two point one and two point uh, success criteria, they are written in a way so they can adapt to a lot of different circumstances. For mm -hmm. example, <laughs> to kiosks uh, or banking terminals or yeah. uh, uh, or mobile phones, so they can apply to all of them. Um, and then we got the techniques where you get like uh, the technical details that you can, uh, how you can implement something. Um, and that's another level deeper. And then it gets into really a lot of additional guidance and a lot of many more pages if you wanted to print it. So <laughs> please don't. <laughs> yeah, the success success criteria, that's really interesting. I, I was reading through those and it's like, it's like okay, so here's one success criteria, and it and it gives you one A basically, right, for this guideline. But if you want to take this guideline and make it even more accessible, here's a double A success criteria that you can try. Is is that kind of the the philosophy? Is that like the more success criteria that you can apply to your website, the the deeper down the accessibility rabbit hole uh, validation you get? Or <laughs> so what happens is when we're trying to reach consensus on what's reasonable to set as a requirement, because we understand that WCAG 2.0, WCAG 2.1, and, and future WCAGs often get adopted into legislation. And so what, what you're going to see is at the A level, you're going to see you've got to do this. And then at the double A level, let me be frank, the stuff that's at the double A level is if you don't do that, you've locked people out with different disabilities. Yeah. So they got lower level in the first version. If I were in charge, um, there would be two levels. Um, the I need to do this level and the I want to be better level. Yeah. Because the double A really isn't like a nice to have. If you've got low vision, if you've got um, some some of these mobile ones, you, you, it's just not going to work. It's not until we get to the triple A where yes, you're getting the color contrast has to meet this requirement at the required level. But if you want to be even cooler, go down to tri mm -hmm. triple A. But not not all SC even have that. Not all yeah. success criteria have a. Uh, and here's a deeper. Yeah. I, I like to use a, a, an example that people can really almost touch. It's, it's like when you're building a house. Uh, if you were to look at a single A level, it would be basically make sure you don't have a step in front of the door so you know a wheelchair user can get in. At a double A level, it would be make sure your door is wide enough for all wheelchairs so that you, know, you can have a no-step entry, and then that's accessible for people that use walkers, canes, and, and wheelchairs, but at double A level, then suddenly someone who uses a power wheelchair that's a bit wider, then they too can get into the, 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 the house. So that, that's one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. It's a good example. So we, we should really be shooting for double A at least, and then hopefully get to triple A eventually, right? Triple, 
Triple A, I actually think that most people just pick and choose, mm. except for Funka, who's just like <laughs> super awesome. And, and they just like, Triple A, bring it. Uh. Nice. Yeah, but even if you if you pick and choose from AAA, it depends on the content you have on your site. So, for example, AAA has stuff like um, uh, live captioning for live streaming video. If you don't have live streaming video on your site, you don't have to, you know, whip up live streaming Obviously. video to, <laughs> to get to AAA. You know, you get that for free because you're not using it, so you don't have to make it accessible. Yeah. Sure. Um, so, Sammy, I bet you didn't know that you needed to provide live captioning for this uh, live podcast, did you? I didn't. <laughs> Until like yesterday when I saw that, I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. I'm having a, a, a live stream you. about this very topic. I can I can help you. It was really neat because Environments for Humans used to hold the Accessibility Summit and I helped them figure out their solution for live captioners. It was oh, it nice. was it was fun. That's awesome. That would be so cool. And yes. captioning's really not anywhere near as expensive as most people think. I will admit live captioning's a little pricier, um, but when it comes to captioning something that's recorded, um, you can outsource it and it's really reasonably priced. Cool, that's that's good to hear. Yeah, we're definitely, so this is like a little spoiler alert for maybe an, an an episode we're probably going to have in about two or three months with uh, Nick again, bringing Nick back to do a live accessibility aud audit of the PHPRoundtable.com website. It's not designed <laughs> with accessibility in mind from the, like, it was just, it was like, designed, like just get it out there real fast because I'm, I'm busy. But it then I, I need, uh, like, I need, this is embarrassing to have uh, uh, actual episodes about accessibility and then not have an accessible website. Like, that's kind of like, that's kind of, that's not okay. So <laughs> we're going to actually be doing this live and so that other people can maybe hopefully be inspired by like, oh, it actually isn't that hard or like, oh, I had that same problem. So. I'm yeah, we love to, to guilt people into updating their websites. <laughs> That's basically one of our superpowers. Inspire, inspire, <laughs> inspire them. other people. Oh, it's uh, English is only my second language, so I. <laughs> so I probably... <laughs> <laughs> True, true. Well, um, so just kind of in, uh, diving down into this uh, this WCAG document, it's 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 really long, but it is broken up into four primary principles: perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And this really helps digest the guidelines a little bit easily, a little bit more easily, or more a little bit more easily, a little bit more easier. Bit more easier. English, your first Easy. language. So. I, it's not. It's not. <laughs> I'm actually a linguist, believe it or not, and I. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking maybe we could just go through each one of these uh, these guidelines or principles. I, I don't want to say guidelines because they're not guidelines. The principles that, that encompass guidelines uh, and, and kind of just get your all's thoughts on maybe where you've seen these in the wild or just kind of um, just uh, some examples or something like that. Just to kind of give people a, a, a good idea of like the higher up view of what WCAG 2.1 is all about. So starting with perceivable, uh, the little little one sentence thing is information and user interface components must be presentable to users in the ways that they can perceive. So this means provide text, like we mentioned before, text alternatives for non-text non content, like images and things like that. Provide captions and other alternatives for multimedia, which we were just talking about. Create content that can be presented in different ways, included by assistive tech, including by assistive technologies without losing meaning, which is an interesting one. Uh, and make it easier for users to see and hear content. We kind of were talking about this one a little bit already, but th this one, it gets a little deeper than kind of the, the higher up stuff that we've been talking about, right? So what I love to think about perceivable is that we're trying to make sure that the content of our, our digital content can get into a person's brain, all right? Mm -hmm. It's perceivable. You can get it into your brain. And one of the new requirements in WCAG 2.1, we had a color contrast requirement in 2.0, but it's only for text. And so if you have anything important on your website that's not text, that's an image, maybe you've got um, the picture of a printer to print something, but there's no words around it there's no requirement that that printer be visible. <laughs> it could be the lightest gray on another light gray where a 20 year old with 20, 20 vision could see it, but the rest of the world's going, what, what? <laughs> so that's, that's an additional requirement that um, I'm happy to see in 2.1, make those important non-text objects have a decent color contrast. Oh. 
Yeah. Very cool. So perceivable uh, is the first of the four principles. Yep. Then we uh, have another one, operable. User interface components and navigation must be operable. Now, the, these, by the way, these little uh, bullet points I'm taking from are from the WCAG 2.1 at a glance uh, page on the W3C website. Uh, and it's, uh, W. do I say that? W3C? W, I always say yep. either WC3 or W3C. W3, W3, W3 World Wide Web Consortium. C. The yeah, that's I switch the three and the C around all the time without even knowing it. Uh, so I always have to double check to make sure it's clear. But there is a website uh, or a page out there on the website that's called WCAG 2.1 at a glance. We'll get it link linked to in the show notes so you can uh, see all of these bullet points uh, in front of your face. But uh, for operable, it says uh, th these guidelines are make all functionality available from a keyboard which I guess uh, removing, like I think it was really popular back in the day to remove the focus attribute or the focus um, using style sheets, right? Because it because people didn't like that little outline that happens when you click on things. Funny thing, I was actually just speaking with Eric Meyer uh, for my podcast uh, last week. And uh, I, I discussed that with him because he, uh, he admits to one of his sin, he wasn't really thinking that people wouldn't read the notes in the CSS reset style sheet that said, you know, we're setting that to, uh, we're setting that to zero, but it's up to you to design it, but people weren't going back and redesigning it. So uh, he he removed that from his uh, version two of the, the CSS reset, but by then it was too late. Uh -huh. It was uh, it was adopted bootstrap into WordPress and everybody thought, oh, well, if WordPress does that, then we should do it. And it became a really, massive pain point for from a uh, sighted keyboard user's perspective. So yeah, if you have links, don't remove the default outline. Just don't. Really, don't, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. The, the other point uh, on operable was give users enough time to read and use content. Do not use content that causes seizures or physical reactions which is one that, that I feel like comes up um, at the, the um, was it the Incredibles? The latest Incredibles movie has a, yep. has a problem with people who have seizures, can't watch the, can't watch the, the movie. Yep. So it's not an accessible movie, <laughs> kind of crazy. <laughs> yep. It's really weird. It's uh, it, one of the things to, to consider is that it might not be a problem with triggering a, a full out grand mal seizure, but it can be as simple as someone is going to get so nauseated that they have to go lay down for an hour or two. Right. So it, it's it's a wide range. We we shouldn't always think of the the um, edge cases of someone is going to fall flat on the ground and flip like a like a fish out of water. That's that's not it. It can be a whole range of different reactions that are pretty disturbing, uh, uncomfortable reactions. So it's it's something we don't want to do. Right, totally. And I suppose in, in some cases, you don't even need a, um, um, uh, a, dis a disability to, 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 mm. uh, to, to get affected. It's enough being burned out or something. So, <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Well, the final two guidelines under operable help users navigate and find content and finally make it easier to use inputs other than the keyboard. Now that's an interesting one because I guess just without actually diving into that one, I haven't looked at that one in detail, but just thinking of how many times I've tried to hijack an input to format a credit card number or format a phone number or something, uh, not even really knowing if that's going to work without a keyboard. Do any of you have a, like any particular experiences with um, making sure that the inputs work with something other than a keyboard or any thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, when was the last time you talked to your car? Did you use a keyboard <laughs> when you were talking to your car and telling it where you wanted to go? No, you were using voice input. So voice input is a wonderful example of not using a keyboard. Um, there, there are many others. Yeah. I, I know someone um, who uh, was a uh, star skier and she uh, skied into a tree and became paralyzed from from the neck down. And she uses a technology called sip and puff. Basically, it's a straw, and she sips and puffs in different patterns, and that allows her to control her wheelchair going forward, backwards, stop, turn, whatnot. She also um, does solo sailing, so she goes into a sailboat 
and she controls her entire sailboat with that sip and puff technology. Wow, that's awesome. And, um, she says one of the biggest frustrations she has is some website will just not work with her sip and puff access to, to you know, she's basically using a switch uh, variation on keyboard and she can't use websites and she can't sail across uh, the, um, the, the channel between France and, and England by herself in her sailboat, but she can't use your website. Wow. That's, That's a great good. story. Yeah. yeah. Well, looking at the third of the fourth uh, four principles, understandable information and the operation of user interface must be understandable. And so there's three main guidelines under this, which is make text readable and understandable, make content appear and operate in predictable ways, and help users avoid incorrect mistakes. This one almost feels like just um, more, more of like just but improving user interface design for everybody, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, you can you can totally say that. So a lot of accessibility improvements uh, help everyone. Um, mm. You know, uh, the the difference is that for people with disability, it's really, uh, really, really important. You know, it's uh, uh, because they otherwise are. Um, uh, have a big barrier and probably can't overcome it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, everything that is in, in this section is uh, giving you time to uh, to make sure you have put in the right data and uh, uh, and uh, everything is described uh, nicely and in a, a way that you can um, you can understand. And that's uh, that's really important. Um, and that you know where you are, like in a in a process when you are uh, in a shopping cart, um, that you can clearly and easily and simply identify where you are and what you need to do next. My favorite experience um, when I was working at the University of Texas at Austin um, and working with Dr. John Slayton, uh, who was a blind professor, I would go and test our new website redesign with John. And what I would learn every single time is that we had a fault in our early designs that he would pick up on faster than any sighted person. And for him, like Eric said, that fault in the design, the accessibility problem would be a barrier. Once he pointed it out to me, I would go, oh, it'll be better for everyone if we redesign that. And it might have to do with an error message that, you know, sighted people were like, oh, what just happened? Oh, you know, and, but for John, he would go, Glenda, I don't know what happened. And it was a wall. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think it's also important to, uh, for those three uh, principles that that you already named, uh, it's really important that those are principles that are not only uh, uh, addressable in the code. You know, you have to you have to start from the beginning, from the design stage, mm. from the uh, planning stage. Like when you have live video, you know, who is doing the live captioning? Uh, as an example, or who is doing the captioning afterwards, uh, if you want to go to double A. Uh, that stuff is a uh, way where you have to come in and you have to plan and manage your accessibility. And it's not just throwing a line of code somewhere. Uh, that's not how that works. Mm -hmm. True, true. Well, moving on to the final principle, it's robust. Content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted by a wide variety of user agents, including assistive technologies. And the, the guideline are that maximize capability with current and future user tools. Uh, oh, sorry, that's compatibility. Maximize compatibility with current and future user tools. So what, I'm not, I'm not I don't know, um, I don't quite understand like specific examples or or kind of what this this one's kind of shooting for other than it seems like you just kind of want to make sure that you like we were talking about earlier with where you put the error message putting it inside the label seems a more robust way, way versus using the aria tags is that kind of what robust is, is shooting after so the area down there when i think of it there's there's two 
main pieces in 2.0, and that is, did you write your code according to standard? Can it parse correctly by assistive technologies or any technologies that we are not even aware of yet? So one of the recommendations, I bet Funka does it, is validate to the HTML standard. If you're writing HTML, validate to the dang standard. So that's the first one. It has to do with parsing. Um, and then the, the second one is name role value. Remember when we talked about the responsibility of the developer when they decide to build a widget? If you were going to use a form control, a radio button, something like that, and you're just going to use native HTML, everything's already built in to that radio button from HTML. But if you're going to build it from scratch using a div and JavaScript, then you've got to give it a name and a role and a value. It is a button. And what is its role here? And what is its actual value? Those things don't come for free. So that area down there is for when you're building from scratch. Yes. And you also have to think about the uh, proper uh, use of the keyboard. So uh, mm -hmm. if you're building a, a, a input or whatever uh, from scratch, uh, you have to follow the ARIA authoring practices um, uh, document that has like really outlined what you need to implement in JavaScript to make it work like, you know, the same thing on the desktop uh, or uh, built in, uh, in in HTML. Uh, and that's usually a lot of work. So uh, better use the stuff that's built in in the first place. Uh, that's what I always recommend. Um, and again, uh, in, in 2.1, there's also status messages, uh, which is new, right? Um, so uh, can you talk a bit about what that does? So status messages, um, if we interpret, many of us that are already in love with accessibility have already been making status messages, error messages apparent to screen readers by default. But WCAG 2.0 only said the error message must be available in text which means a developer could throw an error message on the screen and not tell the screen reader, the person who's blind, that that new content has been added. Mm. So you and I saw it because it was big and it was bold and it made the page kind of change. But the screen reader user, it happened above where their focus is. Mm. How do they know to go Easter egg hunting for it up there? And so the new requirement on any new content that truly is a status message that you would need to understand to know something was successful or there was an error or to move forward in the process, you now have to programmatically make it possible for assistive technology to know new contents here, it's up here. So is that sort of like a flash message? Like say you create something and then it refreshes the page and it has that new status message at the top. It's like a flash message. It's only there for that one session. Uh, you, like programmatically making sure that assistive technologies can see, oh, that's that's the, the message they need to see on this page. And whether it's a toast message that pops up or one that just occurred above where you are, because understand a screen reader is working linearly. Mm -hmm. And so they were down at that submit button. And when you they tried to press submit and the page didn't submit because they had an error and you threw in the error message up here, their focus is still down on the submit button. Mm -hmm. So how do they know that error message got added there. You and I see it because it was red and it flashed at us. Or maybe we saw it. How many times have you been on right. the board where you're like, enter, why won't this enter? And it's yeah. like, there's a little error message up there, but it's so like not paying attention. So the cool thing is, while I just described it from a screen reader's perspective, there's a big cognitive perspective here. Help me help all of us understand where this new content changed. So that's when we get into the fun stuff, when it's not just helping one disability type, but actually making it better for all. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really, really huge selling point, especially when talking with shareholders and being like, hey, like we need to go through and you know make this more accessible. And they're like, well, we don't have anybody that needs that. It's like, no, 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 well, let me talk about how this improves the overall user interface yes. and experience for literally every single person who views this website. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really cool selling point. You know, the, the other thing on this, we don't have anybody who comes to our side that needs accessibility. Way back when I lived in uh, in Chicago, and I found a mechanic. He was brilliant. He fixed cars quickly. It, he was honest. He wasn't expensive. The only problem is he had a step 
in entrance into his uh, his uh, garage into his office and third time i went to see him i said pete you you gotta put a ramp in and he says why should i put a ramp in you're the only person in a wheelchair that comes to see me and i said pete look at the step why do you think that is that nobody in wheelchairs comes to see <laughs> and suddenly i saw a penny drop it's like oh my god <laughs> he spent three hundred dollars putting a ramp into his office and suddenly i was able to refer him a dozen other people in wheelchair that needed a reliable mechanic nice. so you know sometimes maybe you don't have anybody that has a disability because they can't get in um, then again on the web we don't have any metrics we don't have any way to measure who comes to our site with uh, a screen reader who uses keyboard only who is uh, colorblind? We we don't have that information, so we can't assume that we don't have anybody, uh, any visitors, or even e any of our staff that don't have disabilities. I, I know, I know actually web designers that are colorblind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it it seems weird, but we're out there. People with disabilities, mm -hmm. we're out there. There's twenty percent of the population that has a disability. So you can't say, oh, nobody with disability comes to our site because you just don't know. Right. You may have just locked them out, like you said, right? Like <laughs> they're not yep. there because you locked them out. <laughs> so yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. And for, from my experience, uh, a lot of times accessible solutions, once they are found by someone, they spread around like wildfires. So yeah. That's awesome. uh, one of the uh, conferencing options was very or is very accessible. And now everyone is using them because it's such an accessible uh, thing. And it just, you know, it just spread around. So it, it makes sense to implement it and, uh, uh, and just, you know, ma make a point of, of catering for not just for, you know, a majority. For sure, for sure. Well, this has been really good. We do have to kind of wrap it up because it's getting uh, close to that wrap up time. And I have more notes here. I think we're probably gonna have to just maybe copy paste these into the next accessibility episode, like I mentioned before, in a couple of months when we bring Nick back on to do live accessibility. Audit of the PHP Roundtable make me feel really bad about all my code, but that's okay. It, like inspire <laughs> <what>? you <laughs> exactly inspire, and I hope like I'm totally okay with uh, being the one that gets picked at to inspire others and be like, hey, his code sucks too. I don't have to feel so bad. <laughs> um, so uh, I definitely hope that inspires others to um, kind of. Um, uh, try to make their sites more accessible. I already, I know you've got this probably in your shameless plugs, Nick, but you have a website out there specifically for making podcasts more accessible. And I've gone through and I started kind of preemptively thinking like, oh, let's see if, let's see I, I, like how good I'm doing so far. And I'm already like, it's kind of being like, oh boy, I'm in for a, I'm in for a <laughs> lot of things through this, uh, this live accessibility audit. So, uh, but uh, the developer shout out is the, typically the uh, the segment that we transition into next, which is uh, recognizing a developer in the community for doing something awesome. But for this episode, I dropped the ball on the developer shout out again. This is like, I keep doing this. I apologize. It's just kind of busy. I, there's a, a couple of quite a few sponsors actually who have been reaching out to me wanting to sponsor episodes. And I just haven't been uh, giving them the the stats and pro the sponsorship prospective stuff that they need. I finally got one after what I think what four years of having a podcast. I finally have a sponsorship pro uh, <laughs> prospectus uh, PDF I can send people uh, because I, I had no way of tracking the analytics just because like I, I, this is not something that I've, I'm care, I care more about just getting the content out there and, and sharing knowledge versus like trying to like monetize and like track and analyze and all that stuff. So this stuff is sort of coming like four years later because, uh, you know, the, the number one thing for me is the education aspect and, and making sure that we're all continuing our education together. Um, so uh, let's wrap this thing up with some shameless promos. I know um, uh, some of you have some some fun things to, to promote. So uh, let's kick it off. Maybe Eric, do you want do you have anything you want to shamelessly promote? Uh, yes, I can uh, shamelessly promote the new website of the Web Accessibility Initiative um, where I worked on and the group with the Education and Outreach Working Group. So if you're interested in our WCAG 2.1 guidance and, you know, techniques and stuff like that, uh, go to w3.org slash WAI. Um, and uh, we got a lot of stuff there. Uh, for example, we got the accessibility fundamental section, which has the accessibility principles uh, outlined um, in a very nice way and really easy to understand, I hope. Um, if you got any feedback, you can contribute on GitHub. So uh, if you don't understand something, let us know. We want to mm. improve the site. Um, 
that's really important. Um, and yeah, and I'm uh, really proud of the site and that we have all that guidance now in a format that you can actually find it because that was very hard before. For sure, for sure. Glinda, do you have anything that you want to promote? AKA Good Witch, right? I did, I did. Um, so one of the questions we didn't get to is how can people go about using automation to do accessibility testing? And I want to tell everybody about a tool called Axe, A-X-E. It is the accessibility engine. And if they'll just Google AXE and accessibility, you're going to hit it. Um, it's an open source tool that you can download an extension to use in your browser. Um, or if you're really highfalutin, you can actually pull the core engine in and run it during um, when your uh, programmers are um, testing at that at that code stage, not just at the browser stage. So that's the that's the big plug that I wanted to make. And for anybody wanting to learn a little bit more about accessibility, uh, check out DeQ University. Excellent. What about you, Nick? Do you have anything you want to promote? Oh, so many things, but I'll, I'll limit myself to just one. Uh, check out the Accessibility Rules podcast, a one one y r u l e s dot com. Uh, there's a uh, long form podcast. There's also a, a series of five to 10 minute segments, the uh, sound bites with people with disabilities that tell us in their own words, what bears they encounter on the web. And, uh, I even now have a series started, uh, long form in French. So there you go. Very cool. What about you, Sandra? Do you have anything that you want to promote? Uh, no, I can't say I have. I haven't prepared anything. So I'm going to check out the other um, uh, tips I got here. So it's going to be really interesting to see to see the uh, at least this uh, X, uh, accessibility uh, testing thing. <clears throat> I sure. don't normally I don't normally use any automatic tools. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting. Oh yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> awesome. What about you, Tobias? Do you have anything you want to prom uh, promote? Uh, I think I don't want to shamelessly promote myself. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some workshops in the in this in the last, next few months in uh, in Croatia and Web Summer Camp and in Symphony Live, Berlin. So if you wanna if you wanna be learning some more coding with me, I'm I'm there. I think it's still some tickets left in into Croatia. Very cool. Awesome. Well, our next episode will be one that we've tried to schedule for probably a year now and has never been able to nail down a date and time. Sometimes it's really hard to nail down a date and time when working with four or five different people's schedules. So that one is concurrency generators and coroutines. Oh my, we're finally going to be talking about this episode that's been sitting on the docket for so long. It's happening July 26 at 11 a.m. EDT. That's Eastern Daylight Savings Time. So if you have been waiting for that episode, it's finally going to get here. We're going to have another one, uh, a couple of other episodes coming down the pipe, doc blocks, annotations, and the like, which should be an interesting episode. And then the GDPR for PHP devs. Uh, it's a little bit late to the party on GDPR stuff, but hey, it still affects us, so why not talk about it? And then All Things Drupal is also slated. There's a bunch of other episodes coming down the pipe. If you have something that you'd like to share, on the PHP Roundtable, maybe a topic that you'd like to hear or something that you'd like to join the panel for. Just hit me up on Twitter. I'm Sammy K, or you can ping the PHP Roundtable on Twitter. There's also a form on the phproundtable.com you can fill out and be like, I want to talk about this, or I want to hear about this. Oh my goodness, this has been a, a great panel. I'd like to thank, who do we have here? Eric, Glinda, Nicholas, Sandra, and Tobias for joining us in this episode. And we'll see you folks in the next episode. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. You. <laughs> to accessibility.